Hello, um, yeah, I'm, I'm new to Sprue. I just wanted to say before, because there was a lot of talk about training scientists in epistemology and policy. I only just started at Sprue. What I was doing before that was working at Imperial, building those kind of projects for undergraduates. So if any of you are interested in those projects, do Google Imperial College Global Horizons, because they've built a whole project like that. It's still a work in progress, but people are doing this. And I think there's probably people from other institutions that are already doing that too. Um, but I started at Sprue. I'm officially head of public engagement. I'm not quite sure what that means yet. So if anyone's got any ideas, uh, do let me know. Uh, and I'm going to talk a bit today about um, social media campaigns, which could promise some idea of opening up science policy a little bit, but I think the ones that we've seen, particularly in the UK in recent years, have been uh, maybe the opposite of that, and ways of articulating quite traditional forms of, uh, quite traditional patterns of scientific power and traditional ideas of scientific expertise. So I thought I'd start off with Harry Croteau, uh, a, a great um, a hero of University of Sussex, one of our Nobel Prize winners. Um, he recently joined Twitter, and he joined Twitter because the Royal Institution is potentially up for sale. And this is what happens, apparently, now when scientists get worried or angry about something. They join Twitter. Uh, I noticed that Jim Watson from Sprue has joined Twitter this week. I don't know if that means he's angry about something. Uh, we'll have to follow him. Follow, follow Wednesday. Uh, Jim, I think it's Watson Jim too, if you want to find it. Uh, yeah, so Harry Croteau has joined Twitter. And... Um, Actually, the link on his webpage, the Save the RI site, is slightly out of date. This is the one you want. You want save21albemarleystreet.com. Um, and there we are with a, a picture of money, because it's all about the money. Um, and interestingly, also, a nice juxtaposition with all this social media stuff, an image of the Royal Institution Lecture Theatre, which this campaign is about trying to save. Um, we've seen a lot of campaigns like this. It's quite a small one, arguably, although maybe, maybe it'll build. Um, more, maybe more significantly in recent weeks, there's been the all results reported, um, all trials registered, all results reported, or the more 140 character friendly uh, all trials campaign, which kind of stems off Ben Goldacre's most recent book, Bad Pharma. And uh, this really, it's kind of getting many, it wants lots of people to sign this petition um, on um, reporting clinical trials results. Um, and embarrass people who aren't being involved. So the larger, as well as having people's tweets just from all over the world on their website, they also have logos of major organisations. Um, but what it does is it takes what has been an internal debate within the medical community for a long time and makes it public to embarrass these people publicly. I think that's really the function of the publicity in that. Um, there's also, in the summer, there was, from Sense About Science, the um, Don't Destroy Research um, campaign, which anyone who's involved in GM might have uh, come across. And th this wanted to articulate a, um, a public that was support, supportive of GM research to counter activists that were against it. It's an anti-anti-GM um, programme, which also resulted in a piece of direct action against some people who were doing direct action. It was all very complicated, but uh, this, was, this was an interesting campaign that happened in the summer. Um, and there was another um, quite Notable one in recent years was from two years ago, uh, or a year and a half ago, the Science is Vital campaign on the run-up to the Comprehensive Spending Review, which resulted in a, a rally outside the Treasury, uh, which allowed me to take my favourite photograph, which is Keep Science Public on one of the protest banners. Lots of people wearing lab coats outside the Treasury, so standing up for uh, research funding. Um, now, this sort of campaigning in the relatively, and I want to stress relatively, open spaces of social media, I think is an interesting development, which just scholars of science and uh, science should be interested in. I think we should be interested that Harry Croteau has joined Twitter if we're interested in scientists. Um, but I also, from a more normative point of view, we might welcome it as a sign of greater openness in lobbying around science, making it more scrutinisable, more accountable, and possible, possibly more able to learn from a broader, more diverse set of perspectives. It could be a challenge to whose expertise counts. It could be a chance to challenge whose questions count. Um, but there are still things that we might be sceptical of about these and a lot of criticisms to make. Um, hashtags have histories and hierarchies as much as anything else. There are cultures and contingencies here that we need to pay attention to. I think one of the reasons that we've seen a lot of this activity in the UK is partly because of the very grassroots structure to our sceptics movement and that that movement has been quite influential in a lot of that. It's one of the reasons why Ben Goldacre comes up a lot again and again in this. Um, it's also, there's been the experience of libel reform in the UK. Um, uh, there, my point is generally that these things are always located in a social context, and if we're going to study these as sociologists, we should untangle that. Also, just because there are small moments of openness doesn't mean that still the majority of power brokering in science is, if not an outright secret, is generally kept quite, es is quite esoteric. Um, we need to think about the way that openness might be used rhetorically to draw attention away from those more esoteric uh, um, dealings. 
And I want to think about the ways in which ideas of the public and publicity are being used here. I think they're all used in very different ways in different campaigns. And whether these are similar or different from other rhetorical users of the public, be it the use of public polling data or protests outside like these or, or, or other kinds of activism, um, or just sort of rhetorical references to the public at, at large that we, we quite often see in, in political discourse. Um, now there was on the previous to the Science is Vital campaign, there was a lot of social media activity on the run-up to the election, which also linked to some events and some mainstream media coverage, largely coalescing on Twitter around the hashtag SciVote. Um, now, I was um, asked to talk about that in a s conference about science online that just after the election, and I'd, so I dug up my old notes on that, and I realised that the main point that I made about that at the time, which I still stand by, although I'm maybe a little bit more critical, is that although limited and limiting in many ways, the side vote, because it was a hashtag, um, it was a hyperlink, and therefore it connected people. A hyperlink, like anyone who's used the word will know, it links. It links from one thing to another. The rhetoric of the link is one of the first things I teach my students when we do web studies. But it, is, it does connect. And um, the hashtag connected people to events, to information, to ideas, to debates, and quite simply other people. Um, it let individuals develop knowledge and interest and foster community. You weren't just one person in the lab who felt a bit grumpy about politics. You could uh, find your uh, way to find other people who felt the same. And you didn't have to feel weir weird about being a bit political. And I think there's potentially quite a lot of interesting research to be done on members of the UK scientific community who became slightly politicised during that period, not just around the election stuff, but around the David Nutt sack, which also had quite a lot of... Uh, well, I said, yeah, it got hashtag nutsack. I mean, this is funny because the way Twitter likes to make jokes. Uh, but the way that also David Nutz took to Twitter when he was angry. Uh, and that fostered community of other people interested. There's been some work on the way in which the bad science blogging community and sceptics in the UK have politicised some scientists. And I think that's maybe something we could build on. Um, I still think it's important to remember how much of a role offline lobbying plays around this. Um, this Science is Vital campaign is a lovely grassroots story that this one uh, lowly postdoc was just sitting in her lab and listening to Vince Cable on the radio and got really annoyed with him and so started tweeting about it. And these tweets built up into a blog post which built into a long comment thread and next thing they knew they were outside the Treasury and then delivering a petition to um, Downing Street. However, they, along with lots of sort of clicktivist activism of people signing their petition, they picked up a lot of expertise along the way and a lot of them were very well connected. They also significantly picked up the support of the Campaign for Science and Engineering, which had been founded two decades previously, 25 years previously to that, as Save British Science. It had a quarter of a century's work on this very issue. Um, it had an office, it had a huge, well-connected network of people. It had an office intern who could do a lot of work on this. Uh, and th they could link into that. They also linked into the profile and expertise and networks of Evan Harris. And they were building on work that had been going on, uh, not just by Case, but other organisations since previous election before that. I, I think the, the Royal Society may have done something at some point, maybe, on, on this issue, yeah. Um, and that's not to say that science is vital as a sort of grassroots thing had no impact, but it, it, we've got to think about how it fits into a larger set of, of lobbying things. It's interesting that David Willits has mentioned um, science is vital as being influential in his success, apparently, of gain, keeping um, ring fence science budget. Um, I think that that shows the political power of this kind of rhetoric around the idea that the people are interested uh, and maybe the ways in which a, a Tory-friendly protest could be produced. Uh, it, again, this is interesting. And it's striking that a lot of the online science policy campaigns have this kind of grassroots feel, feel to this and, and there's a rhetoric to that. On, in some of the um, obits to the Rio talks in the summer, John Vidal in The Guardian wrote one of these pieces trying to be hopeful post-Rio. There was a series of these. And in, in his piece, he claimed that um, the campaigns to end fossil fuel subsidies and save the Arctic were eye-catching bottom-up bottom up global initiatives. And uh, whenever anybody says bottom-up, you've really got to ask who's bottom. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I do... It was eye-catching eye bottom-up global initiatives. They were eye-catching. Uh, potentially, they had a lot of power and maybe good things, but they weren't bottom-up. They were pre-planned. They were launched at Rio. They didn't emerge at Rio. Uh, they were more about enumerating the actors of public relations than they were diffusing political power. I think that Save the Arctic expressed the public and continues to do that with its projects working with girl, networks of girl guides and things. It doesn't necessarily try and involve them to do anything substantive in the programme. That's previously been planned out and strategised by, um, by the campaigners. I think that said, that said it's, I think it's fair to say that both the Liberal Reform campaign and um, 
some of the, and certainly Science is Vital, and maybe some of the other things that Centre About Sciences have been involved in, has picked up a lot of expertise as well as just these actors to, to do their, help do their PR. Um, I think it's picked up lawyers and lobbyists and people outside the scientific community to help them um, do their work, which you wouldn't necessarily see in some of the more professionalised uh, projects we've seen for environmental campaigns. Um, but they're still, they're not necessarily interested in finding new opinions, they just want to find more people who have the same opinion as them. And they don't want to ask new questions, just find more people who will sign up to their answers. And this in itself isn't necessarily a bad thing. I think we can have science campaigns as well as science debate, but we need to see that that's what these are. Um, I th just to go back to the All Trials campaign, which I do think is one of the more interesting ones that's happened, and it's, it's also been arguably one of the more successful. It's all, this is slightly different from the others too, because it's about showing off a problem in science and showing up a gap in evidence. Um, and I think that that's, that's interesting and different uh, and makes it slightly, well, distinct from some of the others and shows a way in which there's maybe more potential for some of these other, other programmes like that. I think there's a lot of potential in, the, in these campaigns. I, from a public engagement perspective, I haven't quite seen them being realised yet, though. 